Yes. <laughs> It's good. Now I know it's a proper Zoom talk. Sorry. Which, uh, <laughs> yes. Which reminds me of the days that I'm anywhere. Yeah. So anyway, I want to. Okay. Last thing. Okay. Yeah. So I want to convince you that you guys should care about these models as well. Oh, is it on? Okay. So much for this. I can. <laughs> okay. Uh oh. It was working a minute ago. Let's okay. let's just run with it. Okay, great. So now that we hopefully sorted out all the technical difficulties, so I'm going to begin by highlighting several ways in which time considerations play a curiously secondary role in causal models, or at least in you know dominant causal modeling tradition. And I'm going to offer an explanation for this. I'm going to suggest that this has to do with the history and application of these models. And typically, they've been applied to static systems and systems that are at equilibrium. This is going to provide the backdrop against which I'm going to present these dynamic causal models, in particular, Iwasaki and Simon's models. And these models allow one to represent a system when it's away from equilibrium. So given the story I told, these will be a generalization of traditional causal models. After that, I'm going to use these models to argue that causation is relative, or the causal relations in a system are relative to the time scale at which that system is represented. And then at the very end, I'm gonna tentatively propose some implications for various discussions that are taking place, for example, here, uh, about the relationship between network models and latent variable models. And for this part of the talk, I just need to be very upfront. This is not my area of expertise. This is your area of expertise. and I'll put it out there and I'll be curious to see uh, what you guys think, whether what I'm saying sounds plausible. But in any event, I thought it would be useful to draw some connections, especially because uh, we'll have some opportunity to be talking about it. OK, so to get started. Uh, so first of all, when I'm talking about causal models, I'm talking primarily about the graphical modeling frameworks developed by people like Yuta Pearl and spiritually more in shyness. And the most basic way in which time is secondary here is that time does not play a role in the basic semantics of these models. Now, what I mean by that is suppose you have two causal hypotheses. One is that X causes Y causes Z. Another is that Y is a common effect of X and Z. Now, the way that these get distinguished, distinguished within the models isn't by looking at whether Y comes before Z in time or vice versa. Rather, it's ter in terms of the probabilistic implications of the models. So if the first model is true, then X and Z will be dependent probabilistically, but independent conditional on Y. If the second model is true, then X and Z will be probabilistically independent, but dependent conditional on Y. So the basic implications of a model are not spelled out in terms of time. And in general, I think there's a lot to be said for that. So historically, there have been lots of attempts to cash out causation in terms of causes preceding their effects and saying that it's part of the definition of causation that causes come before their effects. And there's lots of reasons not to want an account like that. And I think the biggest one is that even if you think that as a matter of fact, causes usually do come before their effects, perhaps you think that they always do, you don't want to make it part of the definition of causation that that's the case. It's not a contradiction to suppose what would happen if an effect came before its cause. So here we have a whole way of characterizing the causal ordering, facts about what comes before what, in a way that's conceptually independent of the time ordering, and then it becomes a substantive question about whether these orderings uh, yeah, coincide. Okay, so I think, as I said, it's generally a good thing. Uh, that said, there are some questions that arise about, well, what are the temporal relationships among the variables in a particular model? And in my view, this is not as clear and not as unambiguous as you might expect it to be. So here's a discussion that you'll see in discussions of these models. So the most common representation here is a directed acyclic graph. So the graphs do not allow cycles. And something that people might ask 
for example, to me when I give a talk on this is, well, is that a problem? Are you worried that these models do not allow for causal cycles? And the standard answer that's given here is no, because even in cases where you think there might be a cycle, the cycle will disappear when you time index the variables. So for example, you might think that there's a cycle between income and education because people with more income can get more education and vice versa. But if you're more careful, you see that income at t equals zero causes education <coughs> time t equals one and so on and so forth. So the apparent cycle disappears on time indexing. And the thing to note about this response is that this presumes that when someone gives you a model and they have not said anything about the temporal relations, that really the variables do have you know, specific discrete times and we just haven't mentioned them. So in other words, we're treating the variables as if they're events uh, with specific times. And even though they have these times, we just throw out that information or ignore it. And here I want to suggest that there's another way we could think about this, because it's at least prima facie puzzling if there's this causally important information that we're just not paying attention to. And the alternative story I want to tell is one in which it's not that these are just events that we're ignoring the time from, but there's a more complicated relationship by which the variables in our models abstract away from the more detailed temporal relationships and the more detailed temporal uh, information about our measured variables. So just to give you some rough sense of what I have in mind here, so imagine you have a vector of variables, uh, for instance, a time series in which the yeah, each variable is indexed to a particular time. Well, depending on whether the time series is stationary or not stationary, uh, this is going to make a difference for what your available compact representations are. So if the time series is stationary, uh, which I guess for this audience, everyone's already familiar with what this means, but basically that you can switch the subscripts around and it doesn't change the statistical features. Uh, so in that case, the time order does not matter. While if you have a non-stationary time series, uh, for example, a time series in which the mean or variance are increasing over time, then the time ordering does. And the only point I want to make right now is that in case we have a stationary time series, that can make it easier to just represent a huge vector of variables as just some single quantity. So to think about a really simple case, if you think about each measurement is generated by some variable that has a mean value plus an error term, well, then you could have a thousand measurements, but the time isn't playing any role there. So you can just represent the whole series basically as a single data generating variable. So that's just to give you some sense about the type of simplification I have in mind. And now I'm just going to say something about non-stationarity, because uh, this is going to come up, up later. And this is also going to be the second way in which I think temporal relationships get simplified within causal models. So now I'm just going to quickly recap a debate that's played around, that's played out in the philosophical literature. Uh, so Hans Reichenbach, in 56, he spelled out the principle of the common cause, which says that if two variables x and y are correlated, uh, then either x causes y, y causes x, or x and y share some common cause. So every correlation has some causal explanation, but not necessarily direct causal explanation. And this principle still matters because even in contemporary causal inference methods, there's a principle known as the causal Markov condition, uh, which is the foundational principle, but it still entails the principle of the common cause. So if this were false, then that principle would be as well. Now there's a famous purported counterexample to this uh, given by Elliot Sober. He says, think about British bread prices and the sea levels of Venice. Both of these are things that are rising over time. And he claims that they're correlated. So if you know that, bread, that sea levels are higher, then you also have evidence that bread prices are higher. Therefore, he claims it's a correlation, but these are not causally related. And this is supposed to be a counterexample to the principle of the common cause. Now, lots of people have responded to this, uh, but one response I particularly like is given by Kevin Hoover. And he points out, so breadth prices and sea levels, these are both time series. Uh, they're both non-stationary time series. They're monotonically increasing over time. 
And his point is that for these types of time series, in order to figure out whether they're probabilistically dependent, uh, you need to use um, a particular type of probability model. And in particular, the, the test of whether these types of time series are independent is whether they are co-integrated. Uh, and later in the talk, I'll say what co-integration means. But the key preliminary point is that what Hoover is responding is these variables or these time series, uh, they're not in fact probabilistically dependent. Therefore, they're not even a potential counterexample to the principle of the common cause. Now, I think that this response in fact works, but a question you might have is, okay, well, what if we had different time series? What if they were co-integrated? Well, what would you be allowed to infer about causation then? And of course, I know that there's a huge literature out there on time series methodology, including in econometrics. But in lots of cases, it's very hard to figure out when those models and when those methods can be interpreted causally. And it's also the case that these models are pursued pretty much independently of the causal models I'm talking about today. So this is yet a further way in which the causal modeling tradition I'm focusing on today simplifies the temporal relations. It's much easier to apply when you have stationary time series. And when you have more complex temporal dynamics, there remain some open questions about how to use them. Okay, so now I've suggested several ways in which time plays a secondary role in these models. My background hypothesis for this is that this is actually a result of the history of causal modeling, and in particular, the history of causal modeling in econometrics. So I'm not gonna spell out this story today, and I think there's more work to be done to spell it out. But basically, I think the role of time in these causal models is a vestige from the, their application within econometrics, where within the structural equation tradition, uh, the focus ended up being more on more stable system, static systems, systems at equilibrium. And uh, if you want to see some evidence for this, I think Mary Morgan's work tells at least part of the story here. Now, against this backdrop, dynamic causal models of the sort I'm about to discuss, uh, these are a generalization because they allow one to discuss the behavior of systems when they're away from equilibrium. And if you accept my general story here, then you can use these dynamical causal models to say something about the conditions under which causal models more generally apply, as we'll see further. Okay, so now we can finally get to the modeling part of the talk. And I'm gonna go way back to Herbert Simon's 1953 paper, Causal Ordering and Identifiability. Now, Simon is trying to figure out where do we get these asymmetric causal relationships, given that lots of basic equations from the sciences are themselves symmetric? So paradigm example, the ideal gas law, uh, pressure times volume is proportional to temperature. These are all variables measured at equilibrium. So this equation, you have an equal sign, and it's just an ordinary non-causal equal sign. Doesn't tell you anything about whether you know, volume causes temperature or temperature causes volume or anything like that. So where do we get asymmetric causal relations? Well, Simon says, even though this equation by itself doesn't have any causation built into it, if you fill in additional information about the system, you can get a causal ordering. So suppose we are told that this is a fixed volume system uh, and the ideal gas container is immersed in some adiabatic heat bath. Well, now we know that temperature and volume are exogenous. So their values can be specified independent of the others. And then we can first solve uh, from temperature and volume from equations two and three. And now the first equation tells us that we can solve for pressure given those values. And I really need to hasten to add here that this is not some procedure for getting causal knowledge without causal assumptions. So when I gave you these equations and I said that temperature and volume were exogenous, that was a strong causal assumption. I was saying they do not depend on other variables in the model. And additionally, we could have filled in the details of the system differently. So if instead of a fixed volume container, it was a movable piston, so a variable volume container. Well, now we are going to have a different set of equations uh, with different exogenous variables. 
and we're going to end up with a different causal ordering in which temperature and pressure cause volume. So yeah, once again, not a way to get yeah, causes out without causes in, but very often uh, when you're sort of taught about causal models, you're told, okay, here's a set of you know, asymmetric equations and you're not told where they come from. Well, if you use this method, in the cases where you can solve for a causal ordering, you can rewrite the equations as structural ones. So a structural equation is one in which each variable is given somewhere on the left-hand side as an effect of its causes. So this just gives you a bit more detail of the assumptions that go into deriving these equations. Now, they don't say it in the original, or Simon doesn't say it in the original paper, but in this later paper with Yumi Osaki, they claim that the original causal ordering method uh, was originally devised for static systems consisting of equilibrium equations. And the aim of dynamic causal models is to then generalize this uh, causal ordering method to systems away from equilibrium. Now, before moving on, there's one last preliminary. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about time scale throughout the talk. And I find it useful just kind of following operational definitions. So when I talk about considering a system at a longer time scale, uh, so one can think about that as you're sampling the variables in the system at a slower rate. When I talk about a shorter time scale, you're sampling the system more frequently. And when I talk about the system being at equilibrium, I imagine that we're considering it at a time scale at which all of the variables had enough time to reach steady state by the time they're sampled. So in some ways I can give the rest of the talk and just talk about equilibrium and dynamics and say nothing about time scale, but for lots of systems we care about, systems that do have long run equilibria and also systems where the perturbations uh, from equilibria correspond to more transient dynamics, it's going to be helpful to have this way of jumping between a talk of time scales and talk of equilibrium and dynamics. Okay, so now let's see how the dynamic models work. And the running example here is gonna be a pretty simple one, but it'll work for our purposes. Uh, it's a bathtub. And uh, in this bathtub, water is flowing in at the rate of Q in. It's flowing out at the rate of Q out. The bathtub has a depth uh, and a pressure, and K is the size of the drain. Uh, now this has both shorter term and longer term behavior behaviors, roughly in the shorter term, the depth and the pressure, along with the size of the drain, determine the rate of flow out. But there's also a longer term behavior, which is that if we assume that the system goes to equilibrium, so it doesn't, the bathtub doesn't drain and it doesn't overflow, uh, at some point, the rate of flow in is going to equal the rate of flow out, and that's the equilibrium state of the system. Okay, so to solve for the ordering at equilibrium, uh, we start with a set of equations. Uh, so the rate of flow out is proportional to the size of the drain and pressure. Depth is proportional to pressure. The rate of flow in is exogenous. The size of the drain is exogenous. And because we're assuming the system is at equilibrium, the rate of flow in is equal to the rate of flow out. Now, if we solve for the causal ordering, we have our exogenous variables. From five, we can solve for the rate of flow out. From one, we can now solve for pressure. And from two, we can solve for depth. Okay, I'm guessing this is not the model uh, many of you had in mind when we started looking at the system. It's very counterintuitive. Uh, you might have this thought that, well, Q in causes Q out via some of the other variables. Uh, because if you were, say, to turn up the rate of flow in, turn a faucet higher, well, there'll be a period of time during which the depth and pressure will change uh, and via the depth and pressure changing so will the rate of flow out so to make any sense of models like this it's really important to keep in mind that we're assuming all the variables are at equilibrium so if you ignore that transient process where the system is away from equilibrium the only thing that the equilibrium rate of flow out depends on is the equilibrium rate of flow in and then given uh, the rate of flow out and the size of the drain, that also determines what the pressure and depth must be at equilibrium. So that's the rough interpretation of the model, uh, but in some ways we really just want it here as a 
stepping stone to get to, to the dynamic model. Now we could give a fully dynamic model here where every single variable in the model is given with its time derivative. Turns out that we actually can also have a mixed model. So we can use some of the equations the same, and this is gonna to correspond to the assumption that these variables are still influencing one another at a very fast rate at the time scale that we're considering. So we're gonna still treat these relations as if they're instantaneous. In fact, the only change we make here is we're now gonna assume that the depth is not at equilibrium. So the rate of change of depth, the first time derivative of depth, that is gonna be uh, proportional. In fact, it will be equal to the rate of flow in minus the rate of flow out. When we add in this extra time derivative, there's a few other changes we need to make to the model. First, we're gonna to need to specify an initial condition for depth. If we don't do that, we can't sort of get the cycle going. Additionally, we have this mathematical equation, which points out that, so this is an integration equation. This points out that integration and differentiation are inverse operations. And what this corresponds to is it's a way to put some time into the model. So using integration, you can use the current state of depth plus the time derivative in order to give a discrete approximation of its value at the next time step. Now, the fact that we specify an initial value for six, that is important here, because it basically makes depth exogenous in this model. Okay, so now uh, we have our exogenous variables, including depth. And now using equation two, we can solve for pressure. And using equation one, we solve for the rate of flow out. From equation five, we solve for the rate of change of depth, which using integration, we then get depth at subsequent time steps. Okay, so this is hopefully a saner model, right? The rate of flow in and rate of flow are determining depth, which is determining pressure, which along with the size of the drain determines the rate of flow out. Now there would be a way to do this without derivatives. Uh, so if you want to try to time index this, uh, it would basically look as follows. So variables connected by ordinary causal arrows, these are just treated as simultaneous. Uh, the integration links uh, correspond to variables influencing one another across time, uh, like so. And once you've sort of gotten, you've used D0 and the other causes of D to get D1, so the value of depth in the next time step, you can basically keep going. Uh, so this would be a way to unroll the graph and to do this without the use of derivatives. And the one thing to point out here is that even though here we're going to add time to the variables, we're not doing it in order to use the time to infer the causal direction, right? The important information here is that you have two types of variables, variables that are simultaneous, and those are the ones that influence one another at a very quick rate, while variables that are treated as diachronic and we may cross time steps, and those correspond to relationships that take longer to occur. Okay, so the purpose of just this whole example is just to give us a model to play around with and just so I can now illustrate the basic operations that you can do with this model. Now, the most important one is equilibration. And equilibration is what you do when you take a dynamic causal model and you take a variable that's away from equilibrium and you derive what the model would be if the model were to reach equilibrium. Uh, and this works as follows. Uh, so you start by setting all derivatives of d to zero and then removing them from the model. One then deletes any equations going into d because d is the uh, variable way of equilibrating. And now you just apply the causal order again. And now if you look at equation, well, what would be five here? We can now combine that with equation three and the causal ordering will work exactly the way it did in the initial equilibrium model. So using equilibration, one can take a model uh, that's away from equilibrium and to derive the equilibrium model. Equilibration is one of two operations you can apply. So when you apply equilibration, uh, you treat the reaction, or you take a variable that's reacting to other variables and you treat that relationship as if it's occurring instantaneously. So as if it takes no time to occur, you're moving from the diachronic model to the synchronic model. There's another operation that we still need to talk about called exogenization, 
And that's when one variable is influencing one another very slowly. And what one does is through exogenization, one treats the variable as if it were constant. And I think a useful way to think about what these operations are doing is in terms of the metaphors of zooming out and zooming in. So when you apply equilibration, you can think you're starting with a model at one time scale and you're zooming out to a time scale at which the time it takes the system to equilibrate uh, is treated as instantaneous relative to the uh, longer time scale. While when you're exogenizing, you're zooming in, you're taking a process that at one time scale um, takes some time to, that, that at one time scale is happening, uh, you know, one variable is influencing one another very slowly. And when one zooms in, uh, it becomes so slow that one can treat it as if it is uh, constant. Okay, so using these operations, I can now finally tell you what I'm onto when I talk about causal models being relative to a time scale. And here I'm going to use an example that goes all the way back to this paper by Simon and Vesher from 1966. Uh, though uh, I spoke to Nick Vesher about it, he doesn't really remember it, but <laughs> <laughs> I think it's 1966, you know, it's a while ago. Um, but anyway, so in this model, uh, it's a very simple model. The amount of wheat grown in a field depends on the amount of rainfall and the acres of wheat that are uh, planted. Now, rainfall is about as uncontroversial and exogenous variable as you possibly imagine. But it turns out that if you think about these not just as single events, but as repeatedly measured quantities, over a sufficiently long time scale, agriculture does influence rainfall. So if we cared about say 50 to 100 years, it could be that the amount of wheat planted on a regular basis could uh, influence the amount of future rainfall. So we could give a more complicated model where there was a cycle and wheat was influencing rainfall, presumably by a lot more variables. So what's going on? when I give all of you this model and you're all say, this looks like a good model. I, mean, I guess I didn't call you, but you know, why does it seem compelling? Well, if we are operating on a sufficiently short time scale, so we're just thinking about the next five years, any influence of wheat on rainfall will be so slow that we can just treat rainfall as if it's exogenous. Yeah, so, and this would of course correspond to um, the exogenizing operation, that if you started with the cycle uh, in the model, uh, but applied exogenization, you zoomed into the five-year period. In that five-year period, you can just treat whatever epsilon influence wheat has in rainfall as just totally negligible. Now, there's a lot I'd like about this example. Uh, one thing is just that when you're taught about causal models, there's always this mantra of no causes in, no causes out. So you can only get causal knowledge with causal assumptions. So someone tells you, oh, these variables are exogenous. And given that you assume facts about exogeneity, you can get facts about causation. But even if you don't want, say, a reductive analysis, you might say, well, how, how do I know? Well, what does it mean? What, how does the world need to be for variables to be exogenous? I find examples like this to be helpful for at least thinking which features of the world uh, actually make a difference in when a variable is exogenous, or at least when you can treat a variable as effectively exogenous. Now, something I want to highlight specifically for the sake of this talk. Uh, so, as I've emphasized, depending on which time scale you're considering a system, you can have different causal relations. Uh, so far, the changes we've seen have been pretty minor, whether they're cycles or not cycles, but in any case, there could be some fairly substantial differences between the models. And it's important to note that whatever other issues you have with this, there's not some contradiction between the models. So if we were to be really careful when you're considering a system at a longer or shorter time scale, those are gonna be different variables, right? You're sampling the system at a different rate. So there's no contradiction there any more than say you have a room that's regulated by a thermostat and you turn the oven on and five minutes later, the room is you know, a bit warmer, but an hour later, it's not. 
right? There's no contradiction there that you have these different time scale uh, causal relations. Uh, similarly here, there's not, yeah, they're not the same variables. So there's not a contradiction with there being different relations and different models. Okay, so now um, in the next few slides, we're gonna go a bit quickly, but the purpose of the next few slides is just to convey that there is an ongoing debate about the equilibrium models. And I don't wanna just kind of speed past them without acknowledging that there is this debate. Uh, so a few people, and I think most, ex or in the most extended way, Denver Dash in his dissertation have given reasons to think that equilibrium models and therefore the process of equilibration is not a reliable, um, it's not a reliable operation. And his particular examples focus on yet another ideal gas system. So of the sort we were talking about in the Simon discussion. So here, once again, you have a gas in a container that's immersed in a heat bath. And uh, we can have different relations depending on whether the, we fix the volume and we're gonna get one set of relations uh, or we can unfix it, remove the plunger and get a different set of relations. Uh, and the pressure of the system is regulated by mass. That's the basic setup. Long story short, uh, so here we have a dynamic model for the system. Basically what's going on here is that here the mass is determining the force on top of the cylinder, which along with the force in the bottom determines the acceleration of volume, uh, which determines its velocity, which determines uh, its position. Uh, and then the velocity determines, uh, yeah, the velocity, sorry, the volume along with temperature determines pressure, which determines the force in the bottom. So what this dynamic model is basically doing is telling you when the ideal gas system is away from equilibrium, what is the self-regulating loop by which the system is pushed back towards equilibrium. And the key feature of this model is that depending on whether you equilibrate it or intervene on it, you get different models. So if you apply equilibration, uh, the operator I just introduced, you end up with the model on the right. So this is the model for the movable piston system. If in contrast, you manipulate it, so you hold volumes fixed, well, this is gonna be a clamp intervention. So this is gonna hold volume fixed in place for an indefinite period of time. So you're not just gonna fix volume, but also hold its higher order time derivatives to zero. And when you do that, you get the model on the left, uh, which is the model for the fixed volume system, the sealed container system. Okay, now I think that this is actually a nice result. I mean, I think these are both good causal models and that the fact you can derive either of them using these two operations is a good thing. But uh, there's a literature going at least back to Dash of uh, being really worried about this discrepancy. And the type of concern that Dash has concerns commutativity. So there is a formal operation for interventions called a do operator. And Dash is worried that the do operator and the equilibration operator do not commute. So basically, what this means is that, so when you apply the do operator to the dynamic model, you get the one in the top left. And when you apply equilibration, that has no further effect. When in contrast, you apply equilibration and then you apply the do operator to volume. Well, it's a property of the do operator that it is only supposed to break the arrows into the variables you intervene upon. If you were to intervene on volume, hold it fixed, you would not get some case where you just remove these two arrows. You would end up actually with the fixed volume system, uh, which is not what's predicted by this. Uh, so that's the sense in which the two in which the two operators do not commute. Okay, now my response to Dash here is that commutativity is just the wrong way to think about this. So this is a case where the operators should not commute. So basically, probably all of you at some point have seen various arguments about whether various operators commute. And the assumption there is always that you're considering two different formal operations uh, corresponding to two actions that just doesn't matter what order you apply them. So if you were representing where to walk and you talked about whether you go north then west or west then north, 
right? That shouldn't make a difference. You should end up in the same place. This is not like that. It's not the case that when you intervene as opposed to equilibrating, you're just doing the same thing to the system. Uh, and the reason is that, so when you uh, equilibrate the system, basically you're saying, well, what would happen if I let the system reach its equilibrium volume without interfering with it in any way? When you intervene on volume, you break the self-regulating feedback loop by which the system comes to equilibrium and you end up in a different equilibrium state. So equilibrating and uh, intervening, they lead the system to different states. There are two different ways of bringing the system to equilibrium. And because they're different states you're bringing the system into, there's no reason to think that the operators should commute. Okay, so that's my response to Dash. Again, I'm really trying to be upfront here. There's an ongoing discussion here. So Tineke Blum and Yoris Moore on this campus, they're also talking about these models and they also have their own criticism of actually various of the models we've talked about. Uh, but in any case, uh, this is just, uh, so it's an ongoing discussion about how to think about these, but I think at least the arguments that are out there do not undermine the equilibrium models. Okay, so before getting to the uh, psychometric stuff, I do want to make one connection back to co-integration. So to my knowledge, there's not a worked out systematic relationship between these Iwasaki and Simon causal models and various features of a probability distribution. So I just want to give some indication about how you might start to bring them together. Okay, so first let me explain what co-integration is. Do this relatively briefly. Unfortunately, I have a nice example that I'm borrowing from these people. So suppose that one day I'm walking to work and I see a lost puppy <laughs> on its own. Yeah, I know how to get people back towards the end of the talk. <laughs> so yeah, so I see a puppy and I'm a bit nervous. I don't know where the owner is. So I decided I'm gonna go follow the puppy. And I get the sense the puppy is a bit skittish. So I don't wanna get too close. I think the puppy will just run off and then that won't help anyone. So basically I'm not gonna follow the puppy step for step but I'm gonna keep the puppy in eyesight. And whenever it looks like our distance is getting too far, I'm gonna close the distance. So simple example, but it has some nice temporal features. Uh, so in the shortest term, uh, there's no relationship between my short-term steps and the puppies. I'm not following the puppy step for step. There is a long-term relationship between me and the puppy. We're never gonna get you know, above a certain distance. And there's also a causal ordering because I'm following the puppy and the puppy is not following me. Now, co-integration is supposed to get at the long-term relationship here. So if we gave a time series to the puppies, uh, the puppy is doing a you know, random walk or a drunken walk. Uh, I also have a time series. Uh, and because in the short run, there's no relationship, there's gonna be no relationship between these two time series. However, if you take the difference between each time series, there will be a relationship between the, you know, the time series that have been differenced one time. So this is just what it means for there to be co-integration between the time series. Now, in terms of the causal models, uh, there is a way to represent this. So first we have the dynamic causal model. So in the short one, this shows there's no direct relationship between the puppy's current position and mine. Uh, there is a longer term relationship because I'm looking at the distance between these and using that to determine my future tra trajectory. So that's what the dynamic causal model shows. You can also equilibrate this uh, and then you get a simpler model. And this shows that in the long run, uh, the puppy's position is determining mine and not vice versa. So simple case, uh, but it is a promising result that you're able to combine these pretty straightforwardly. Okay, so now, finally, as promised, <laughs> I promised you guys some latent variable and network models. Okay, so here's my understanding of what's going on in these various discussions. So as I'm sure all of you know, so we have latent variable models where the correlation between various indicator variables is explained by a common cause. 
And in network models, uh, we have a different relationship. So there's correlation between these various variables is not explained by a common cause, but rather by the various interactions among the variables. So of course, there's a debate for both these types of models about whether to interpret them causally. I'm not gonna get into that at all. I'm gonna assume that we're just gonna interpret both of these causally. Uh, and here we're gonna assume that there's reciprocal causal relationships between the particular variables. Now, one reason why these have become very popular in the last few years uh, is that certain people uh, have been uh, using them uh, to give an analysis of psychiatric disorders. And the general picture here is that instead of saying that a certain psychiatric disorder explains the various symptoms, rather you just have a symptom network. So perhaps you know, X1 is sleeping poorly, which causes negative affect, which causes one to be more stressed and to sleep more poorly. Um, all of the symptoms are interacting with one another. And I take it that the ultimate metaphysical picture is that it's not that there's some disease that's causing the symptoms. The disease is the symptoms. It's a constitutive picture. Okay, so that's my very quick gloss about uh, the story told about these models. And in general, these are treated as if they're competing uh, in, in a few ways. Uh, so one way is that uh, there are discussions out there, for instance, in Reid's work about, well, which is the right model uh, for a set of variables? So empirically, how do we distinguish among them? Uh, additionally, uh, in the BVS paper um, by Forsboom, Kramer, and Callis, there is a discussion of the different metaphysical pictures corresponding to these different models. So that's also a way in which they are in some sense competing. And really, the one question I want to raise about these, uh, based on today's talk, is, well, are the models, in fact, competing? And there's a few reasons to wonder about this. Uh, so one, uh, just a very general reason, is, are the variables the same? So at least in the informal gloss I've given, uh, so when people describe latent variable models, often it seems to be very stable properties and talking about more long-term relationships. While the gloss over the network model is often about shorter term relationships among the symptoms in the network. So did I sleep poorly you know, last night, causing me to uh, feel bad today? So at the very least, uh, as a general point, the variables are not necessarily the same, in which case empirically, there's going to be a question about whether they're in fact competing because they could have different causal relationships at different time scales. Now to say a bit more and fill in the details, uh, I'm going to tell a story about how they might in fact be saying, be giving the same story. Uh, so here is just a uh, generic uh, symptom network uh, from yeah, uh, one of, from Denny's 2017 paper. And these, as I said, we're just going to assume this is a cost of representation. So these are reciprocal relations. So perhaps S3 is whether someone uh, consistently takes a certain drug, uh, which might yeah, influence their mood in various ways that would then make a difference in whether they're likely to keep taking the drug um, or whether they're likely to comply with what the doctors say when they're told to take the drug. Okay, so this is a network about how all these things influence one another in normal non-intervention circumstances. And it could be the case, at least in principle, that if we talk about an intervention on say S3, which is why I've claimed to be the drug variable, that that would have long-term effects on the other variables in the model. So again, an intervention here is a clamp intervention. We're assuming that basically against someone's will, uh, you're making sure that whatever else, they take the drug every day indefinitely. And then you see, well, after a certain amount of time, how is that influencing the other symptoms in the network? And it could be that S3 is a common cause of various other symptoms in the network, while not vice versa. I mean, of course, it could be lots of things. So obviously here, uh, what's gonna happen will depend a lot on the causal facts and how we interpret these variables. And certainly it could be the case that given canonical interpretations of what they are, this story will be less appealing, but the general thing I'm pointing to, at least to the extent we're talking about this in the abstract, is that if you grant that these different models are at different timescales, it's certainly possible that they're in fact not competing. Uh, 
uh, with another, with one another. Okay, so now I'm ready to wrap up. So first of all, I've noted ways in which the temporal relationships among the variables in the model, it's not always transparent. And I think it's valuable to really, at least sometimes think about what are the relationships and what they might be. I've argued that the causal relationships in a system can vary with the time scale at which you consider it. And finally, uh, it is possible on this picture that models with very different looking causal relationships can be compatible. And then I speculated that uh, perhaps this is what's happening in the network and latent variable case. Uh, so yeah, so now I'll stop and we can take some questions.